Chapter 12, Language of the Dragons. Sitting in the wagon next to Marga was awkward. The space was cramped, stuffy, and not only did Marga talk in her sleep, she talked a lot in her sleep. To distract himself, Skell had decided to read from the Dunco book. He caught light from the opening in the back of the wagon and anchored the book against his leg so that the wagon's jostling movement wouldn't make him lose his place. Wake up, Stonehead, he heard Smyrna say from outside. Skell looked up through the moderately sized opening to see her sitting on the shoulders of a fagum. She was holding a long chain to trail across the ground while she traveled so she could keep channeling the Earth's power. Morkin had suggested the idea a couple mornings ago when they'd first started traveling together. Skell put a finger on the open book of the page open page of the book to mark his spot. I'm listening, he said. Have you found anything in that evil book yet? Smyra asked him. Anything useful, you mean? Don't be thick, Smyra snarled. It's mostly propaganda, Skell explained. It's reassurances for the victim's family, vague promises about a new age when the Dunco will... It's a yes or no question, dung tongue, Smyra snapped. Skell took a deep breath and released it. No, he said. Without another word, Smyra steered her fagum to the left and moved forward out of Skell's line of sight. He sighed and returned to his reading. Zansklis Bakarasa, Marga, mu Marga muttered. Bakarasa Klintorm. Skell shook his head to clear it. Was Marga getting louder? Zansklis, Zansklis, she muttered again. Marga's face was twisted and uncomfortable, but she was definitely sleeping. Perhaps she really was babbling, and these were simply nonsense words instead of the dragon's thoughts. Maybe the wyvern was trying to intimidate them. Skell turned away and tried to ignore her, skimming through a section on the Dunco's eating habits. He stopped when he realized that the way they ate was actually significantly different from most humans. He tried to force Marga's mu mutterings out of his mind as he read. Bakarasa Klintorm, Marga said again, much more loudly this time. Frustrated, Skell paused in his reading. Should he go get Tsar? Something was definitely happening. Torm, Zansklis, Bakarasa Torm. Now she was shouting. Tsar would be here any moment to check on her. The wagon stopped, and Skell could hear Zarm dismounting from his horse nearby. Zans Klis Bakarasa Klins Torm, she, she uh, screamed. Skell couldn't look away. His, her face was contorting, her jaws forced apart by the power of the unearthly scream. What was the wyvern doing to her? Then her eyes opened. Zar ripped open the back of the wagon in time to see his wife reach for Skell's face, her hand burning with dark blood fire. He grabbed the boy and dragged him out of the wagon. The boy struggled to land on his feet, holding his book tight to his chest as he hit the grass. Zans Kliss, Marga screamed and rose to a sitting position. Stras Torsum. A vicious hissing erupted from the ground around Zar's feet. The patch of thick grass they'd been traveling through was crawling with snakes of every size and description. Those closest to Zar and Skell lifted their heads, ready to strike. Zar's sword was out in an instant, but he stopped as he felt Skell's hand clap over his eyes, blinding him. Blink, the young wizard ordered. Zar shut his eyes as he heard Skell mutter a short phrase under his breath. A moment later, a blinding flash of light assaulted his eyelids. His face suddenly felt hot, as if the air was burning. When he opened his eyes again, the grass was singed brown, and the snakes were writhing against the ground, rubbing their heads against the dirt in blind agony. Smyra, her forefagum, and Largalarg were immediately on the snakes, stomping mercilessly and crushing the blind serpents' heads and bodies into the ground. Zar blinked repeatedly to try and get rid of the bright spots clouding his vision before he joined in, using his sword and his boots to dismember as many serpents as he could reach. Zar looked around for Morkin, but the Drakenfeck was already in the wagon's back with his blowgun to his lips. Zar breathed a sigh of relief as Morkin let the dart fly and he heard it connect. Then there was a loud crack like thunder and Morkin was on the ground, limbs writhing. Marga stepped out of the wagon and pulled the dart out of her neck, surveying the carpet of bloody pulp that was all that was left of the snakes. In the silence that followed, Largalar grabbed Morkin and dragged him away from her, his dark cloaks were shining with snake blood. Smyra came over to stand next to Zar and Skell, leaving her fagum to stand nearby. Why isn't she knocked out? she asked. She sounded more annoyed than concerned. Zar eyed Morkin, lying stunned between Largalarga's massive hands. I have no idea, he admitted bitterly. Marga turned to face them. You are fools, the wyvern said through her. You cannot keep Zan's Kliss asleep forever, and even in sleep I can use her to call on my allies. The snakes, I imagine, Zar said. The snakes are your allies? He walked a few steps toward her. He hoped her lightning couldn't reach this far, but he had no real way of knowing. Snakes, the wyvern supplied, and far worse. Marga pointed to the south. Zar didn't turn, but he heard a gasp of recognition from Skell. Aja, aja, he said with concern, three of them about two miles away. Zar sighed in trepidation. The aja, aja were rare, enormous snakes that prowled the Eltar plains. 
preying on elephants and any herders foolish enough to fight them. They had three heads each, grew to over ten feet long, and could spit streams of corrosive poison from their mouths. Zara couldn't let the impending danger distract him. Marga and the Reverend, controlling her, were easily more dangerous, and he needed to stall them long enough for Morkin to recover. He stepped between her and Morkin so that when he awoke, she wouldn't notice. The Aja Aja will be no problem, he bluffed, staring into Marga's eyes intently. I have two magic users with me now, a wizard and a phage. They can dispatch a few overgrown snakes. As we've seen, the Reverend eyed the flattened snake corpses all around her. If so, then I'll simply have to wait longer to be reunited with my precious one. Something inside Zara began to burn like a fuse at the words precious one. You knew her before then, he continued, his voice much quieter. Before you kidnapped her, I mean, and took over her mind. She was mine to take, the Reverend report retorted from Marga's lips. She was always mine to take, Zan's Kliss. The last words hissed from Marga's mouth like a challenge. Zara's fingers wrapped around his sword's hilt. He wanted nothing more at this point than a way to strike at his enemy, but the Reverend was far, far away. If you want her, Zara said, you'll have to kill me. Too risky, the Reverend said. You crave nothing more than to die for her. To kill you might break my grip. If you don't kill me, she will never truly be yours, Zara walked to within an arm's length of her. As long as there's breath in me, I will always be fighting to free her, he promised. I'm sure you mean that, the Reverend said, but once you're dead, there's nothing to stop me from stinging her back to me. This time, she stepped closer to Zara, so close he could feel her breath on his face. Watch the skies, little human, the dragon whispered. When you die, I will be there. A frown creased Marga's face as another dart landed smoothly in the nape of her neck, followed by a second and a third. Same goes for you, Zar said as he caught Marga in his arms. He looked over at his companions, then at the Aja Aja in the distance. At their current speed, he guessed they would probably be on them in less than an hour. Whatever they did next would have to be done quickly. As he and Morkin carried Marga back to the wagon, he came to a decision. I need to break the spell, Skell heard Zara say to Morkin, his fingers on a glass vial in his belt. That's the only way we'll be able to lose the Aja Aja and find somewhere safe to hide. They'll follow us to wherever she is while she's under that curse. Morkin was gesticulating rapidly, his fingers moving so fast that Skell could hardly believe Zara was able to follow it. This discussion had flared up soon after Zara and Morkin, Morkin had situated Marga safely in the wagon again. Skell knew from Zara's explanation that they'd first met... The, Zar's explanation when they'd first met that breaking the spell meant Zar would have to die. He was amazed that Zar could talk about killing himself so matter-of-factly. His death seemed to mean nothing to him more than a minor inconvenience. You don't get it, do you? Zar stomped one foot against the ground. The potions simply aren't working. She's waking up every few days now. And each time you're forced to use more and more of that same potion. Morkin's face creased with an unusual intensity as he answered. Do you think I'm a fool? Zara yelled, cutting him off. Soon, either the dosage is going to be too much, or she'll simply become immune to it. And either way, it will be too late. We don't have any more time. The singing, the signing became more passionate, and the yelling became louder when Skell came to a realization. He raced to the wagon and pulled out the Dunco tome. Turning to the page he'd been reading when Margan, Marga woke up, he quickly finished the passage. In two ways. First and foremost, the infidel prevent, prevents the entry of truth stream into his mind. The first is by inter interrupting the flow of dreams by waking every morning, then only returning to his dreams when night has fallen again. No river can truly be said to flow when it is so constantly being interrupted. The second way that truth stream is prevented is through the eating of so many different foods, which color the dreams with strange sensations as they pass through the body on their way back to the dirt. These are the two great sins of the ignorant masses. We, the disciples of the dream, know better than to allow such interruptions and distractions to muddy the clear vision that each dream should present to the mind. We sleep for ten months out of the year, only rising to perform the rituals of the passing and the bringing during the two months when the sun is at its highest and the mind's eyes are clouded. During this time, we eat only the tears of joy, a powerful food that prolongs sleep and keeps the mind's eyes bright and unsullied. It grows only in the cavern of seeking, where we search the world for, of dreams for the truth that no lie can take from us. Skell lifted his eyes from the book to see that Zara was pulling the vial from his belt. Morkin stood next to him, his eyes hopeless. Larga Larg and Smyra watched on in horror. Smyra actually looked frightened for Zara. Wait, Skell shouted, rushing over. This isn't necessary. There's another way. Zar closed his eyes and breathed a sigh of annoyance. Do you think I want to do it this way? He said through clenched teeth, I can't afford to risk my wife's life any longer. You don't have to. Skell tried to sound consoling, but all he felt was excitement and relief. I found a foolproof way to keep her asleep. 
Morgan watched as closely as Skell opened the book and read the last paragraphs of the passage. Tears of joy, Zar said doubtfully. It sounds like a story to go exaggerate their mystique. There's no magic herb that powerful. Morkin shook his head and began to sing and sign again. Skell watched as Zara's eyes started to soften. What did he say? Smyra asked, annoyed. The concern in her face had disappeared, leaving no sign to suggest she'd ever been worried. Skell wished he could keep his emotions in check so easily. He says that he's heard of the tears of joy, Zara said, in an old recipe that dates back to the, stein, the, the strain. That made sense in a way, Skell realized. The Dunco had come into existence shortly before the strain became extinct and the Drakenfect people had existed for about as long. Still, the idea that an essentially useless strain recipe would have survived a millennium in the hands of Drakenfect shepherds was almost too convenient to be believed. Skell wondered if perhaps Morkin was fabricating a bit. Still, he wasn't about to con contradict anything that might convince Zara to continue the mission and not commit suicide. Admittedly, this would change the plan a bit. Not in a bad way, though. Now that Zara had just as much reason to find the Denko as Skell and Spira did, their chances of a successful re rescuing Pinmei were higher than he'd ever before hoped. He tried to exchange a quick smile with Smyra, who rolled her eyes as if to say, don't get too pleased with yourself. Zara put the potion back in his belt. We'll need to get moving if we're going to outrun those Aja Aja, he said, looking at Skell, then Smyra. How long do you think they can maintain this speed? Not long, Smyra answered before Skell could. Perhaps an hour, maybe two. They don't usually pursue prey over long distances, Skell offered, trying to be helpful. They're stealth hunters. It's very unusual for them to travel in the open like this. I guess we know now what Marga has been saying in her sleep, Zar contemplated. Somehow the Wyvern can call on creatures like him when he needs to. The language of the dragons, Skell thought out loud. It's remarkable that it could have lasted this long when there's no written form of it. That's purely academic at this point, Zar said. He moved over to mount his horse. Larga Larg strapped the horse wagon's harness onto his back. We look for creepy duncos now, the drag said, eyes hopeful. Yes, Zar said, offering a smile to Skell. It's a long shot, but he frowned for a moment as he continued. Four days. That's about how long I'm willing to risk keeping Marga under these new these powerful potions. If we can find the Dunco and retrieve the tears of joy and your brother in that time, I'll feel comfortable continuing the journey. Skell looked at Smyra, who nodded. That's acceptable, he said.